right, welcome to the new Newberry, everyone. Penelope will introduce our speaker and we'll get started. Good afternoon. I'm just trying to get my paper here. Um, my name is Penelope Dean. I'm Associate Professor at, uh, in the School of Architecture at UIC. And Michael Golick, who's um, also Associate Professor at the School of the Art Institute, and I have coordinated this seminar for the 2019-2020 um, academic year. Um, we're continuing on the seminar from um, 2018, I think, through 2019, and that was organized and founded by Michael Golick, uh, Lisa Olson, Brad Hunt at Newbury, as well as Michelangelo Sabatino and Alison Fisher. Um, so thank you all so much for coming. Um, also to the Newbury for hosting the event today, for Mary Hale, who's um, organized so effortlessly um, all the seminars so far, including today's, and also the Terra Foundation, who generously um, supported the event. What we'd like to do is invite everybody after um, Dakota's talk today to have a drink at the Talbot Hotel. With us, Michael is going to introduce um, our speaker today, but before we do that, we just would like to go around the room and learn where, who you are and where you come from. So if you could please introduce yourselves. Amy Collins, Terra Foundation. Medieval Silverman, also the Terra Foundation. I'm Danny Ark, I'm just a community member of the Center for Design Chicago. He's kind of <laughs> <laughs> I've got Joe Brunet, I'm a PhD candidate at Columbia University. Aaron Dunnoff, Harvard Fellow in Chicago. Uh, Mike Lovko, co-convener. I'm Barry Greenman, I'm just all I first. Now, Mary Hill, I'm a city living. Okay. <laughs> well, okay, I'm going to hand it over to Mike. Thanks so much, Penelope. It's uh, my great pleasure to introduce our two participants in this month's uh, seminar, Dakota Brown and Aaron Benenev. The topic for today, presented by Dakota, is uh, the 1947 to 1949 Chicago printer strike and the history of typography which is the result of his extensive research in the Newberry Library's Chicago Typographical Union uh, records. I, I should remark that out of uh, the many uh, seminar presentations that we've had, uh, Dakota's is the only one that has been focused exclusively on materials within the Newberry Library. So it's a great pleasure to um, have Dakota present on material that he's worked on here. Dakota's paper accounts for the formation of the new design and production techniques resulting from the um, 1949 printer strike. And as I understand it from his abstract, labor busting engendered by necessity, the introduction of alternative modes of typesetting, uh, which broke the hold that skilled linotype operators had on Chicago Tribune's uh, newspaper production, um, to uh, what later, as Dakota will assert, revolutionized the fields of graphic design and typography. Dakota Brown is a PhD candidate, ABD, in rhetoric and public culture program in the School of Communication at Northwestern University. He currently teaches courses on the history of graphic design at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and has taught at the University of Illinois Chicago and DePaul University. Dakota's recent publications include American Graphic Design in the 1990s, Deindustrialization and the Death of the Author in Post 45, and Putting Modernism All Over the Map in uh, Jacobean Magazine. I'm also pleased to welcome our respondent for this afternoon, uh, Aaron Benenab, who is the Harper Schmidt Fellow and Collegiate Assistant Professor in Social Sciences at University of Chicago. Aaron's research focuses on, a world law, on worldwide unemployment, beginning with histories of unemployment in Europe and the United States, and then expanding beyond that. Aaron is currently working on two book projects, A Global History of Unemployment, Adventures of the Economic Concept, 1944 to 2019, 
and a world without work, surplus populations in the global economy. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dakota Brown. I worked for a few years right uh, across the hall as the graphic designer at the Library Library. Um, so it's great to be back here on this side of the podium. I used to always uh, sneak out of work to, to see what the fellows were up to. And um, so it's great to be on this side of things. Uh, when I got here in about um, 2007, uh, we had just been donated Henry Rosemont paper collection, uh, which covers uh, his own work. He was a, a lifelong member of the International Typographical Union, and like a lot of uh, the kind of uh, organic intellectuals that this body produced, he became kind of uh, uh, an amateur historian of the trade um, and wrote extensively in the union papers. So a lot of what I'm drawing from is his own writing, but also uh, other other records. I had just written a master's thesis on graphic design in the 1990s. And seeing this sort of collection get here around the same time I did, I sort of got an idea of how that might connect to the 1890s. So I'm hopefully going to be able to touch on a bit of both today. Uh, we have some weird weirdness with the slides, but I have some help from Mary. Um, OK. In the early 20th century, radical modernists undertook a fusion of artistic activity with emerging industrial capacities, a project which promised in one movement to both free humanity from repetitive drudgery and to reunite aesthetic experience with everyday life. During the 1920s, the Soviet artist Elizitsky experimented with hybrids of text and image, leading him to theorize epistemological and technological shifts taking shape in the world of print. A continual revolution in typography and the form of the book, he surmised, could be put to work in perfecting the human sensorium New approaches to text and image would yield a, quote, perpetual sharpening of the optic nerve. Lazitsky read the earliest attempts at phototypography in the context of a historical tendency toward lightness and mobility. The amount of material being used is decreasing, he wrote. We are dematerializing. Cumbersome masses of material are being supplanted by released energies. Such a process would culminate, as he cryptically wrote in 1923, in a final transcendence of print itself, the quote, electro library. Within 50 years, metal type would indeed be supplanted by photographic media in systems that were increasingly driven by electro libraries of dematerialized data. By the 1990s, the convergences and displacements predicted by Lazitsky had yielded the di digital hybridization of writing, typesetting, and imaging. In the end, however, these transformations owed more to the bottom lines of print capitalists, in particular, as we will see, American newspaper publishers, than to the efforts of the radical modernists. While modernism and design was founded partly on socialist visions of industrial transformation, by mid-century it had become welded to the public image of the great conglomerates. Though modernism's trajectory from utopian potential to capitalist instrumentalization is familiar to design history, Parallel themes in the history of the printing trades have received less attention. The initial promise of technological innovations to ease movement and communication, to free humanity from alienated drudgery, soon gave way to the sobering realities of de-skilling and displacement. The contours of 20th century print technologies then would be shaped over by struggles over automation and unemployment. Behind the back of modernism's rise, the quote, released energies of print dematerialization increasingly took the form of outmoded workers. Can we go forward one? The growing coherence and confidence of the graphic design profession is accompanied historically by the gradual fragmentation and decline of the printing trades. The job description of printing originally encompassed a set of knowledges that extended far beyond the point of contact between ink and paper. Early printers were often also type founders, publishers, and booksellers. Even as the craft became more specialized, printing still involved typesetting and composing pages, which often extended to a role in writing. As Union typesetter and historian Henry Rosemont uh, has written, 
Newspaper printers in the mid 20th century relied on broad but informal education in quote, language, history, geography, and other subjects, which enabled them to produce entire articles from telegrams consisting of little more than relevant nouns, verbs, and modifiers. Print workers thus held a strategic position in the circulation of public discourse, which was simply not possible without them. They often took advantage of this position to educate themselves and to advocate for the interests of their trade. In addition to their obligatory literacy, they had access to the press as an organizing tool, an extreme rarity for manufacturing workers of the early industrial era. Journeyman printers became the first group of workers to go on strike in the United States within a year of the Declaration of Independence. As Regis Debray has documented, print workers would go on to play prominent roles in revolutionary movements around the world during the next two centuries. The printed book was, if not the first, then certainly the clearest early example of the world of standardized, mass-produced commodities to come. And as with any other commodity, print production required labor-saving innovations to keep competing firms profitable. More efficient inventions often rendered the work less taxing and dangerous, but the primary motivation for their adoption uh, was always the reduction of labor costs, resulting in layoffs or slashed hours. Print workers thus often found themselves in the paradoxical position of fighting technologies that promised to ease the burden of their labor. Rosemont offers the example of a more efficient ink roller invented in 1814 and vigorously resisted by American printers. The existing standard was a more rudimentary instrument that required periodic soakings in animal urine to keep it from hardening. So this is the work they were fighting to maintain. Um, printers worked in consistently squalid, poorly ventilated shops that contributed to lower than average life expectancies, but such conditions were clearly preferable to unemployment. Though Johann Gutenberg's 15th century press had scarcely changed in the intervening years, the first decades of the 19th century brought transformations far beyond the humble roller. Iron construction and steam power fundamentally changed not only the shape of the machine, but the entire work process that fed and maintained it. However, a major production bottleneck remained. The reproduction of writing still required the manual assembly of each word and line. Printing firms grew to be heavily reliant upon a workforce of typesetters who were both rigorously trained and militantly organized. During the 1880s, several attempts were made to mechanize the typesetting process. Um, could you pick forward one? One uh, particularly spectacular failure was the page compositor, that's it on the left, uh, which bankrupted its primary investor, Mark Twain. As Twain is said to have boasted shortly before the invention proved unfeasible, the page could, quote, work like six men and do everything but drink, swear, and go out on strike. Then in 1886, Otmar Mergenthaler, a German engineer working under contract with the New York Tribune, presented the first working line casting machine. Like type composition by the old method, the linotype process utilized, utilized thin bits of metal. Here, however, each bit carried the negative impression of a character. Operators typed the characters into a line, making hyphenation judgments as they worked. Justification was then carried out by a spacing mechanism that sealed the channel into which the characters had been set. Molten metal, which uh, resided in the back of this machine, was then injected into the channel to form a full line in positive relief. So they're printing line by line rather than letter by letter. Uh, after cooling, each line of type, which is where it gets its name, was stacked into columns and locked into page layouts for the press. While the line of type was an expensive and somewhat risky investment, it delivered on promises of labor cost savings, and in time it contributed to a dramatic enlargement of the size and circulation of the periodical press. Uh, the trade at first dismissed these developments. As one printer's newspaper reassuringly put it in 1891, line types were mere toys for print capitalists with no practical background in the trade. Over the next decade, however, the threat became more palpable. As one unemployed typesetter wrote in 1900, his place at the typeface had been usurped by a monster that eerily replicated his movements without need for food or human dignity. While a steady demand for the manual composition of headlines, advertisements, and other display applications muffled the effect slightly, uh, 
The new work process soon touched off an employment crisis. Younger compositors scrambled to learn machine composition, while thousands of older or more narrowly trained workers fell through the cracks. However, the International Typographical Union, which represented manual typesetters, was able to establish jurisdiction over the machines in strategic industrial centers around the turn of the century. In order to stave off the effects of the transformation, the ITU pushed for shorter work days and encouraged early retirements. As the popular press grew during the teens and 20s, typesetting employment stabilized and even expanded. The ITU grew in tandem and soon became one of the most powerful unions in the United States. However, this position was soon threatened by a number of mutually reinforcing technical innovations. First, teletype setting. Um, I think you get the next one. Yeah. Um, first, teletype setting enabled linotypes to be driven like player pianos. Um, encoded tape, which is what you're seeing on the left there, uh, was poised to replace the human typist. Second, a slew of phototype setting inventions sought to replace the cumbersome hot metal process with cold typefaces stored on film. Giving typography a photochemical basis, in turn, allowed a more seamless integration of text and image, while also making typesetting more readily compatible with letterpress printing's longtime competitor offset lithography. Um, like the beginnings of mechanized typesetting itself, Efforts at moving beyond hot metal were piloted by newspapers. A series of new inventions, referred to in the business as strike-on technologies, combined typewriter keyboards with new counting and spacing mechanisms. Existing clerical workers, needing no knowledge of the line of types eccentric keyboard and metal foundry controls, could be put to work as typesetters. In strike-on processes, each line was typed twice, but first measured the space occupied by the characters on the line, and second, distributed that leftover space into the gaps between the words. During ITU strikes in San Antonio, Texas in 1945, and in St. Petersburg, Florida in 1946, publishers invested uh, in these justifying typewriters and, in the words of one print historian, simply hired women to work on them. Operators of Veritiper and Underwood Electric justifying typewriters successfully broke the ITU strike at the St. Petersburg Times. These two cases did not escape the notice of newspaper publishers in larger, more union-dominated cities. The immediate post-war years had seen a massive strike wave in the US, prompting a Republican-dominated Congress to pass the Labor Management Relations Act of 1947, known in labor circles as the Taft-Hartley Slave Labor Act. Passed with bipartisan support over a veto by President Truman, the act stripped organized labor of many of the bargaining rights it had won over the previous decades and threatened to end closed shop practices altogether. Unions could now be held financially resp responsible for losses resulting from secondary boycotts, as well as wildcat and solidarity strikes. The Chicago Typographical Union's contract with the Chicago Newspaper Publishers Association was set to expire soon after the passage of Taft-Hartley, and the publishers leaned heavily on the new rules in their initial negotiations. The resulting Chicago printer strike, a citywide press room shutdown that lasted from November 1947 to September 1949, targeted not just the major city papers, but the emerging Taft-Hartley order itself. The newspapers represented by the Publishers Associated Association included Robert McCormick's Tribune, William Randolph Hearst's uh, Herald American, and Marshall Field's Sun and Times, as well as the Daily News, the Journal of Commerce, and the Defender. During the strike, the papers put their clerical staff to work on the new typewriters, whose output could be pasted up as right-reading paper layouts, as opposed to being locked up in countless pieces of backward-reading metal. This collage result was then photographically transferred to zinc plates a process normally reserved for reproducing line work in half-tone photographs. Some display type was composed on site, while the bulk of advertising work was surreptitiously brought in from commercial printers. In addition to these technical strategies, the publishers folded new provisions of Taft-Hartley into their existing contract procedures. It had long been the publisher's policy to keep as many of the print-related unions on different negotiation timelines as possible, 
the crucial, the crucial photo engravers union who would be uh, engraving these plates, uh, decided against a strike while their pre-tapped Hartley contract was still in effect and elected to cross the picket line. At the same time, tapped Hartley's effective outlawing of secondary or um, solidarity strikes and boycotts meant that striking newspaper employees could not interfere with the work being farmed out to commercial printing shops. Under the new rules, and this is still the case, a worker is only permitted to undertake an industrial action against his or her own immediate employer. In March of 1948, an additional, an additional 1,500 IQ members from 40 commercial shops were locked out amid widening contract disputes. I move forward to one. And this will follow in the next one. Uh, Richard Norton Smith's lionizing biography of Tribune publisher Robert McCormick provides an idealized glimpse behind the picket line during this time. And I have to quote this in length because it's just an amazing document. Um, fresh from a recon mission in San Antonio, Owen had joined forces with Pauline Ferber, head of the paper's stenographic department, to launch the whimsically titled Manhattan Project, a crash course secretly administered to 20 crack typists. Tripled in size and renamed Operation Musk Ox, the program came to be supplemented with copy readers who were taught the intricacies of an alternative method of setting headlines called phototype, and when students from Northwestern hired to set classified ads, the old Northwestern is the right side of things. Um, you can go forward one. Um, on the night of November 24th, as clattering typesetting machines and composing room fell silent, Operation Musk Ox went into overdrive. Long wooden tables hastily crafted by, in the Tribune's carpentry shop were set up in the fourth floor newsroom. A ragtag force of stenographers, secretaries, and typists drafted from throughout the Tribune Tower worked in 10 or 12 hour shifts at their barotypers. The sound was deafening. To McCormick's relief, 23 unions stayed on the job. Their loyalty exceeded only by their versatility. In the crunch, executives demonstrated hidden proletarian talents. Production bosses pushed carts of metal. Artists dropped their brushes and pencils for scissors and paint pots. As Smith tells it, this ragtag group gradually accustomed themselves to the new processes. The paper shed its initially, quote, haphazard experience and surpassed projections of size and circulation. During the first month of the strike, 47 different newspapers sent representatives to observe the process of publishing a newspaper without linotype machines and without a union. Writing in a union paper five weeks into the strike, Henry Rosemont recorded a very different set of conditions. Chicago papers had to make extreme and in some cases unworkable adjustments to article and advertising deadlines yet they were regularly, quote, 12 to 72 hours late with the so-called news. An unusual number of papers were returned unsold, and the executives apparently looked the other way as newsboys trashed leftover copies at the end of their shifts. As Rosemont wrote, quote, dents in the circulation of the paper, dents in the circulation of paper, which are estimated at between 12 and 28%, result partly from public sympathy with our strike, partly from disgust at the appearance of the Arasad's newspapers, and partly from uncertain and tar um, tardy delivery. The experimental methods yielded a lopsided work process, both faster and slower at specific steps than the established sequence of production. On the night of November 2nd, 1948, these irregularities conspired with um, misleading early vote counts, Conspired with misleading early vote counts and the Republican dominated paper's outspoken wish to see Truman defeated. So, this is something you've probably all seen before. Uh, what you'll notice this time is the incredibly uh, awkward body text that's all being set on, these, on these, uh, these new computers. And there are three, three or four lines here that got glued in upside down, <laughs> actually. Um, so they, they actually, uh, some, some, some uh, people at the newspaper actually kind of backtracked and blamed this gap on, on the technology itself. But uh, it had something to do with kind of the hastiness of getting out the news and the unfamiliarity of the process. After nearly two years on the street, the Chicago Typographical Union ended their strike in September 1949, having won most of their demands and preserving many pre-tapped hardly closed shop rules. But while the strike on typesetting method was discontinued in the affected papers, the episode had strongly hinted at the possibility that wisely deployed, deployed typesetting innovations 
can outmaneuver the union. As ITU historians Harry Kelber and Carl Schlesinger wrote, newspapers across the country embarked on a, quote, campaign of psychological warfare in the form of regular articles on new techniques. These articles luridly, luridly tallied up the number of new machines on order while playing up their typographic quality and ease of use. Many also reported on the sums that US newspapers were collectively sinking into research and development. In the late 40s, the American Newspaper Publishers Association set aside $280,000 to fund new photographic and electronic inventions. <coughs> the ITU was in a strong position to keep these challenges at bay throughout the mid 20th century. Above all, in large markets like Chicago and New York. New contracts forbade machines like the teletypesetter, even though this meant that print-ready stories from the wire service had to be retyped by an ITU member on the premises. It wasn't until 1964 that the New York local signed a contract allowing newspaper linecasters to be run on what it called outside tape, that uh, sort of ticker tape that we saw earlier. Um, um, so they could be run on outside tape on the condition, however, that employers take 100% of the profits deriving from the new machinery into an automation fund that, that provided a salary for a long time for the printers at that time. While this price was prohibitively steep for many firms, it did open the door to similar agreements on prototype setting and eventually to computer systems. During the 1970s, the ITU began to draw down in exchange for the job and pension security of existing members. In the meantime, the new machines had already crept into areas of the inter industry with low union representation. A paradoxical result was that capital-intensive metropolitan <coughs> papers of the New York Times were among the last to make the transition. The final night of linotype composition at the Times, July 1st, 1978, um, is memorialized in the documentary Farewell Each One Sure Blue, directed by ITU proofreader David Loeb Weiss. Among the film's interviewees is a compositor uh, who reflects on his 26 years in the industry. That's six years apprenticeship, 20 years journeyman. And these are words that aren't just tossed around. All the knowledge I've acquired in these 26 years <coughs> is all locked up in a little box now called computer. And I think probably most jobs are gonna end up the same way. Once more, the newspaper led the way in automation, and again, the ITU scrambled to train people in the new processes or encourage early retirements. In the earlier transformation, the work loss to linotype composition was compensated by a gradual but decisive expansion of print production. This time, however, the further rationalization of typesetting destroyed older forms of work while narrowing the number of jobs in the new lines. As Lazitsky had predicted, Metal gave way to film and paper. The material footprint of typography was shrinking. But as long as each text needed to be retyped to be typeset, labor time savings were minimal. The widespread adoption of teletypesetting technology, however, allowed the storage and transmission of coded texts and eventually their formatting directions as well. By the 1970s, computer systems were beginning to dissolve typesetting into word processing. A centuries-old gap separating writing and printing was beginning to close, and this gap had been the very ground on which the ITU stood. The union suffered a long decline and finally dissolved in 1986, just as the personal computer was completing typography's process of dematerialization. It was at that time the longest continuously running union in US history. <clears throat> Okay, I'm going to try to tie this back to kind of more um, more contemporary developments in, in graphic design proper now uh, in closing. From the perspective of graphic designers in the 1970s, print production involved a complex and somewhat opaque hierarchy of work processes, the final product of which was never fully visible until it had been printed. Designers could only approximate typographical treatments, directions on spacing, size, and weight, would then hand off to prototype setting shops to interpret in detail. A separate group of pre-press specialists followed designers' directions on variables like color density or image placement, and then stripped together disparate negatives to create a camera-ready master. But despite the many hands through which could you put uh, despite the many hands through which this such work passed, much of that period's modernist influenced design 
left the impression that it was the project of a singular detached mind. Though there was still a high degree of churn in new machines and processes, this division of labor held stable until the arrival of Apple's Macintosh computer in 1984. Let me go forward one more. The personal computer's centralized capacities formally bound up in massive metal founding operations, delicate apparatuses of type on film, or astronomically expensive room filling computers. To say nothing of the highly specialized workers that attended these machines, or the systems of education and apprenticeship that such a weak workforce presupposed. Tasks that were once contracted out with some degree of some combination of strict direction and trust we're now fully under the control of the individual designer, from the smallest details of letter forms to the organization of entire books. The Macintosh would soon offer image editing, editing capacities with no existing analog, which in turn put pressure on commercial photographers and illustrators. The century since the invention of the linotype had been one of creative destruction in the print industry. Novel forms of work appeared suddenly and disruptively, only to be rendered obsolete in their turn. Once the break provided by ITU contracts was removed, this process could accelerate unabated. By the mid-1980s, typographical technology had reached a height of modernized seamlessness, which ironically contributed to the decline of modernism's hegemony in graphic design. New design software facilitated effects like layering and distortion, which were quickly put to use in visual polemics against modernist clarity. Uh, formal complexity and semantic confusion in graphic design had a long pre-Macintosh history, but in the 1990s, graphic designers raised the stakes of these experiments by linking them to contemporaneous developments in the academy, in particular the linguistic and cultural terms in the humanities. In venues like the experimental West Coast journal Emigre, terms like deconstruction and post-structuralism were applied to the printed page in ways that sometimes required little familiarity with the theories in question. The grid, uh, the grid increasingly understood as a symbol of authoritarian, Eurocentric rationality, was parodied, skewed, or thrown aside entirely. Designers arranged texts into ambiguous formations and designed new typefaces that intentionally thwarted legibility. Postmodern practitioner theorists wrote unsparing critiques of modernism tendencies toward constraint, routine, and hierarchy. Yet a certain modernist faith in technology was also evident in their attitude toward their own work. Could you go? Uh, in 1990, uh, immigrant publisher Rudy Vanderland wrote, in a sense, everything can be learned on the job now. Even critical thinking, exploration, introspection, offset printing, intellectual development, bookkeeping, French literary criticism, programming and contract writing. It can all be learned as you slowly develop into the all-around professional you're supposed to be. <laughs> a mostly unproblematic embrace of technology in the market meant that the movement's theorists showed little interest in the political economy of print that was shifting beneath their own feet. When, in 1997, Immigrate published a rare acknowledgement of the entire industries that were collapsing next door, it was with a heavy dose of shot and fright. I forgot to put this one in there. Uh, so they said this is a less than two sentences that I've been able to find in the entire print run. Many of the printers who have gone out of business over the last quarter century deserve their fate. The grassroots of the printing trade is, after all, notoriously conservative, protectionist, and sexist. Um, while a typesetting and printing, like most American trades, tended toward a narrowly male and white membership and self-image, the heaviest losses in the industry from the 1980s forward were in fact suffered by the largely non-unionized workforce of the coal type shops. Compared to the membership of the ITU, these workers were disproportionately women and people of color. During the last decades of the union's existence, a radical minority within the union attempted to salt coal type offices with the goal of bringing these workers into the ITU. For this faction, technological convergence promised a long-sought opportunity to dispense with the craft union basis of the ITU and form what they called one big industrial union after the IWW that would include everyone from journalists to press operators. And this is kind of a lot to get into now, but um, I, I had an interview uh, with someone who was, who was involved in this effort in the 70s that you can read uh, later. Postmodernist graphic designers tended to focus on potentials for cultural intervention 
at the expense of investigating the material conditions of possibility for their own practice. While semiotic theory and cultural studies open to conversation on symbolic circulation at large, such bare facts as designers' own relationship to wage work receive little attention. Part of the blame lies with the historiography implicit in design education. Transformations of labor and technology receive scant attention in graphic design's major surveys. Philip Megg's landmark textbook, A History of Graphic Design, for example, offers only the briefest hints of the social dislocations that, that accompany automation in the printing trades. One reads, for example, that the first steam press in England was operated in a secret location to guard against sabotage, or that vaguely defined, quote, strikes and violence greeted the first in installations of line casting machines in the US. Otherwise, such histories tend to treat innovations in print technology as a politically neutral process of technical refinement. But the new machines and methods did not just draw from the heavens. Their development was materially supported by employers who aimed to speed up production, capture control over the work process, and as we have seen, break strikes. Typography was born in the mass production mechanism of the printing press. It has thus always been implicated in automation and thereby in the distinctly modern dynamics of overwork, underemployment, and runaway production. It is perhaps not surprising then that a new generation of practitioners has undertaken a more materially rigorous investigation of their profession's history. In the recent documentaries, Linotype the Film and Graphic Means, A History of Graphic Design Production, among about eight others that, that all came out in the same uh, few years, um, both of these were, were directed by practicing graphic designers. Um, in, these, in these documentaries, histories of print production expose deeper issues of de-skilling, unemployment, and deindustrialization. However, while both of these documentaries elegantly organize a complex history of print technology, they also align the labor dynamics uh, that would explain their own narratives. So to give you some examples, uh, Douglas Wilson's Linotype documentary stirringly evokes the lost world of hot metal through humanizing portraits of the workers who kept that world running. In a near reprise of his role as the narrator of Farewell is from Sherlu, the, with the quote that I read you from the composer who is being put out of work, the late Carl Schlesinger is a recurrent presence in this movie. The filmmakers include footage of him singing and tap dancing, and they indulge him as he tells a long-winded story about the time he met Marilyn Monroe. A casual viewer would never know that Schlesinger was also a lifelong member of the ITU, or that he co-authored an important book on the union's automation strategy. Despite its exhaustiveness, in fact, Lanatay manages to bracket the union's existence altogether. Brian Levitt's graphic means takes up where Lanatay leaves off, impressively condensing the jumble of machines that bridge the hot type and digital eras. Graphic means directly addresses the role of the ICU and further the gender division that arose between unionized hot type shops and open cold type shops. However, the decline of the unions presented as a technical technological inevitability, and even as a reputation of male privilege. The prototype setting bosses interviewed seem to be speaking as feminists when they say that the girls did equally admirable work for half the wages. The vulnerability of non-unionized unionized women to the next wave of automation, meanwhile, the one that came with the digital revolution, is never addressed in the end of the movies, so it turns into a commercial for Adobe and, and Apple as these kind of genius corporations. In our own time, technological developments have rendered texts and images almost infinitely produce, reproducible. Along the way, the, quote, electro libraries pre predicted by Lisitsky have taken on unfathomable dimensions. The world that confronts us, however, is not at all one in which machines have freed people from work. It is rather characterized by a severe maldistribution of work and the means of subsistence that that work is supposed to guarantee. Among the most celebrated innovations of our day, are smartphone apps that facilitate short-term, low-wage, benefitless contracts. While typesetting has disappeared as a distinct job, it would be too easy to, to it would be too simple to say that it was simply automated out of existence. Rather, since the late 20th century, the job description of the graphic designer has expanded to include tasks once carried out by the earliest printers. The design software that repackaged the knowledge and skill of the printing trades seemed at first to deliver a dream of autonomy to graphic designers, but these technologies were also off-the-shelf consumer products. This meant that trained and credentialed practitioners 
have less and less of a monopoly on medium. A general facility with image and text has now bled into general literacy, due in no small part to the ease of pirating such immaterial commodities as Photoshop. In the contemporary design press, you can read articles on gig economy apps like TaskRabbit and Fiverr, or possible future roles for AI in the automation of design decisions, and see something that recalls the mix of anxiety and reassurance that characterized coverage of the linotype nearly 130 years ago. These projected disruptions may well turn out to be empty hype, but whatever is in store for graphic design in the coming decades, it will be impossible to understand without accounting for the capitalist constraints and imperatives that have shaped that practice from the beginning. Dakota, thanks so much for that really brilliant talk. And um, he always has the best design slides of anyone that I see anyway, or in my neck of the woods, who, who gives uh, presentations. So I think that um, just to summarize something I think is really important about the talk that he came to really at the end, I think that often when we think about the design innovations, and I'm not a scholar of design, so I apologize if I kind of mess this up or, or summarize it inadequately. But I think that when you think about the design innovations of the 80s and 90s and the kind of French literary criticism inflected um, design of that era, uh, oftentimes what we think of in terms of the technologies that made that possible are, as Dakota said, things like computers, um, new kinds of software, eventually things like Adobe, and um, a kind of story of the valiant designers of that time who mobilized these technologies to transform um, the kind of interaction between uh, the printed word and image. Um, and what Dakota does is he tells us a story of what those new technologies replaced and all the people and all the work they did um, that was lost and in many ways forgotten uh, in this transformation of the late 20th century. So when I hear this story, um, I really think of the the kind of tragic situation of some very powerful unions in this country in the 60s and 70s, of which I think the ITU is a really incredible example. Another union that faced a very similar um, conundrum around automation was the Longshoremen's Union. So if you think about, um, I guess, you know, parts of Chicago really coming through on the railways, right? The containers that arrive by ship, um, often from China or other parts of the world, and show up in these, um, you know, yeah, on the coast and uh, the automation of those technologies that kind of lift up the containers, put them on the back of um, trains and, you know, pull them towards Chicago or on the backs of the uh, long, long, uh, long haul trucks. Um, the Longshoremen unions faced a really similar problem to the typesetters in trying to figure out how to adapt to this new technology which made it possible to transport goods across the world incredibly cheaply and, facilitated globalization in a way that's similar to the way that all these new design technologies and uh, information technologies facilitated late 20th century globalization. And they faced a very similar problem, like do we, is the union strategy here to prevent technological advance and innovation, to try to slow down this process in order to preserve their jobs, or do they accept it and try to bargain for much higher wages for the workers who remain? And I think, like the typesetters, the um, ILWU chose the second option eventually. They were forced to um, admit these new container technologies. And the few remaining longshoremen actually make very, very high wages and have very good or relatively good work conditions compared to other US workers. But there's so few of them who remain, right, and who are able to um, benefit from that. So this, there's something there that I think we should really reflect on um, about how we think about technological change and its benefits, especially how we experience these things as consumers versus the lives of the producers who are often 
you know, their skills and livelihoods are transformed often for the worse by some of these changes. Um, and, it, and it makes us reflect on the possibilities of the world, perhaps, where, you know, the idea that technologies would dramatically reduce the work involved to do something like print a newspaper or transport a good across the world, um, where the benefits of that would be purely positive. And there's something about type in particular, and I think that um, Dakota's talk really gets at this, and especially in those kind of early Elzitsky discussions, the idea that uh, in this new technological innovations, there's this possibility to overcome the division between mental and manual labor, to really create this kind of figure of the future who does, at the same time, engages in intellectual work and also engages in manual work, and whose intellectual life is in some way transformed through an engagement with the physical process of production, rather than having those two things be really separated, and having the kind of managers doing intellectual work and the workers engaging in kind of, you know, um, a, a, a quite boring physical tasks. Um, but of course, that's not the world that we live in today. We live in a world where these kind of innovations really do destroy people's livelihoods. And as Dakota said, uh, these transformations both in, uh, on, on the longshore um, situation and in type have resulted often in like overwork for some workers, underemployment for other workers. Um, and there's a widespread fear today, which is quite related to this, a fear of a general process of automation of which things like typesetting might be sort of a privileged example. And one of the figures that Dakota quoted even makes this connection and says, look, you know, the computer's replacing all the skilled work I did, and I fear this is where most jobs are going to be going. And it's certainly true that specifically in information technology, this process of automation has been extreme. I mean, you know, stepping beyond the, the typesetters, to the newspapers themselves. There's been crushing um, loss of uh, revenue, obviously, in newspapers. The idea that information wants to be free and the difficulty of getting people to pay for internet information services. Um, just recently, it's, I mean, it's resulting in wave after wave of journalists losing their jobs. And so this is a really um, important transformation that it's, it's just a huge thing in, in, in cultural life, I think, and it really affects cultural workers uh, more specifically, even though the flip side of it, as he pointed out, is that this has also meant that kind of design and printing is made available to so many more people than ever before. The idea that you can, um, just as a single individual, decide to start a YouTube channel and produce your own videos or your own pamphlets or your own um, any kind of information is an incredible, like, freeing, possibly freeing technology, or freeing in many cases. Um, but it's, it's important to recognize that actually these information sectors in which we are often immersed in our own lives actually represent only a small share of the overall economy, and that automation is actually quite limited outside of that sphere, I think in contrast to um, the way that that's presented often in the media, like automation is going to take over all jobs. The fact is that it's not really likely to do so. Um, many jobs that were, you know, there was at, at the last big robotics conference, they had this um, uh, obstacle course for robots to get through. And not a single robot made it through, because not a, no, no robot could open a door. It could like simultaneously turn a doorknob, open a door, and walk through it. And if you watch these videos of the robots trying to do that, there's something comically human about their incapacity to complete uh, very basic tasks. But, um, so, there's, a, the other, there's another side to the story, and I kind of wonder how it fits in with the story that Dakota told. And I think, in a way, it requires us to look back to that era of Taft Hartley and the kind of immediate post-war period, when the gains that unions had made, both during the later part of the Great Depression, and during the war, um, were drastically rolled back. At the same time, the US passed a Full Employment Act in 1946. And there was this idea that even if the unions were going to play a subsidiary role in the process, that the US government, through these new Keynesian uh, economic management techniques, was going to be able to guarantee full employment. And what had been taken away from the unions, a kind of 
degree of shop floor, floor control and an ability to respond to technological change and have a role to play in deciding which technologies were allowed to be implemented on the new floor. Um, by taking that away, the idea was that people who lost their jobs through technological change, they would always be able to find new jobs, that the economy would be constantly producing new jobs, and that this would actually reduce workers' kind of reticence or fear of job loss through technological innovation. And a big part of the story that Dakota is telling of the 1970s and deindustrialization and the onset of um, really major job losses across industry in that era is also, I think, in a way that is not quite emphasized enough in a story that focuses on computers and radical technological change, actually also a period in which the economy really started to slow down. And there's been a long-term process of kind of slowing down of first world economies, which has been called um, secular stagnation or a kind of Japanification of the economy. Um, and that, that side of the story which is the way that as these people are losing their job, their sense of fear that they won't be able to find something else to do, um, I think is a big part of the story. And I kind of wonder how that comes into um, this account. So anyway, those are just a few comments to get us started. I think it's a brilliant talk. And although myself not a design person, as I said, um, I find it totally fascinating. And I'm, that, those are just some comments to kind of put it in the context of some of the other developments. In, employment happening tonight. So thank you so much. Uh, well, thanks to both uh, Dakota and to Aaron. And we have time for questions and discussion. We still have about an hour. Um, and so I'll just open up the floor. Um, oh, right. Oh, we've got that down. OK. <clears throat> Um, I could start at the end yeah, with the remark, the kind of passing remark you made about the effect of off the shelf. Am I talking that long? Yeah, we're not going to I'd like to start with the remark you made at the very end about uh, the effect of off the shelf um, of software uh, on contemporary design work. Um, and I, as you said it, I mean, it's an argument that one of these nowadays in the, in the design literature um, to the effect that it is, in fact, limiting the ability of designers to think outside of the, those particular boxes that are being provided by mm -hmm. a very small number of tech companies. Um, but, I, but I think putting it in the longer arc that you provided uh, I'm, I'm trying to, and failing to make a, a, an appropriate analogy with the skilled labor of, of those who lost their jobs in, mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. linotype and then in the um, automation or phototype and then in the uh, PC revolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's weird because sort of the, the, the training you get in a design school is no longer that you're the only person who knows how to make a block of text work or, or knows how to reproduce an image. That is, that is something that, is, as I said, it's kind of bleeding into general literacy. Um, but it's sort of a matter of quality. I mean, maybe if the analogy that, that I see when I look back at the printer's uh, archive is that there are people all along the line, like from, from the linotype moment all the way through the 70s, who are just, they're just like, there's no way there's going to be a world that we don't exist in. There's no way. I mean, the, the comments that Rosemont makes about the appearance of the paper and people throwing it away out of disgust, like, there's this idea that, like, there's no possible way that they're going to automate us out of existence. And that's, like, the humor of that robot cartoon uh, that I showed in the beginning. Um, so I think that there, I don't, I, don't, I'm, I don't really necessarily think that the same thing will happen to the designers, but it's really interesting how little uh, anyone is writing about that. Um, and I think that there is something about, there's, there are things in the, the training of a graphic designer that are kind of um, less quantifiable than sort of a technical skill that allows you to produce a printed work or something. 
Um, and some of that is important, I teach some of that, uh, but some of it, you know, it's easy to imagine a kind of uh, future audience and client base uh, for that, that that goes away. Well, yeah, and the, and the parallel that designers always look at, at least the, the people in my generation who were basically trained in the, in the high modern mm -hmm. world, um, is that people no longer um, recognize uh, what's ugly. Mm -hmm. you know, they don't they no longer recognize what's, um, mm -hmm. what's quality work, mm -hmm. to, to go back to that question of quality. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I thought that the quotes that you had up around the newspaper strike and the, the, from Franklin Roosevelt on how, how bad the paper looked, and you can always throw a slide that shows how bad that front page looked. Um, nonetheless, we've gotten used to reading that stuff, mm -hmm. and we read it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I look at my Kindle and I just, you know, um, plow right through it. You know, I mean, it, it, graphically it makes me kind of throw up, but it, it's the information that I'm looking for. Um, I mean, I think some of my thinking on this is probably uh, influenced by being a graphic designer for almost a decade and then going back to design school, going back to like grad school and reading like really crappy PDFs that have already been marked in. Like they're readable, it's fine. It's not, you know, like there's at a certain degree that's that's not actually important. I mean I think the one thing that I'm trying to do here that I haven't quite figured out how to talk about is um, what happens to the ITU at the end in part is because it's sort of clinging to this image of itself as a craft union. Uh, even though the actual sort of craft basis of that has been decomposing for a century, they no longer sort of set type and do all the kind of editorial work that they once did. But they really cling onto that identity, that work identity, which makes it impossible for them to make certain kinds of alliances with other unions. Um, there's a huge kind of um, disjoint between, like they're able to, the ICU involves at some point the linotype machinists because they need them to be able to strike at the same time. But then they lose the lithographers who are working in kind of rival technology. And then these office workers who are not, not organized just seem like not printers to them. They're not from the kind of printing fraternity, the art preservative of, of all arts, all this kind of stuff. Um, and that, that really is what screwed them. I mean, the, I think that there's a certain amount of inevitability in the story, but I think that that is part of, of kind of the problem. And I, I think that there's a kind of similar thing that happens with graphic designers. We're so sure of the value of their particular training that they don't even really think of themselves as workers or producers. Uh, and if there is going to be some kind of shakeup in the next decade or so, it might be a very similar problem with a kind of excessive self-identification with the job that then um, prevents them from seeing the, the broader social context of, of that job. I'm can't imagine how an academic environment is leading you to these. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Can I ask my question while you're getting water? Sure. Um, Dakota, there are two parts of a question that I have for you, and I think they follow from, um, from Paul's question. I mean, one of the first issues that really struck me was, and you mentioned this very early on, that in early, what, like pre-20th uh, century, uh, printing, typesetting, um, design, if we want to call it that, were all sort of wrapped up into a single shop. And then at some point, and that date kind of like moves around, but uh, a so called professional graphic designer um, is formed, and the field is transformed in part because the print shop gets bro broken up to some extent. Mm -hmm. But in that formation, it strikes me that the graphic designer has always been limited in terms of a black box relationship to production, mm -hmm. whether it's the computer or the type setter or the line of type mm -hmm. machine, that restrictions are always mm -hmm. present. One's always working within um, a constrained field in which certain aspects of craft, whether it's programming or typesetting, are sort of locked into the process. Mm -hmm. Part of the work that a designer does is, in effect, understand in some tacit way what those restrictions are and sort of build it into their design. Basically working as a kind of, um, of a, as a management. Mm -hmm. And so 
I think what struck me, and I, 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 this is sort of my question, the first part of my question is to what extent um, has um, current changes in terms of the loss of those particular crafts or those skills have sort of continued to sort of uh, create sort of uh, the designer sort of going back to those early print shop organizations in which the distribution of labor doesn't exist really anymore. The sort of whole process of design, production, pre-print, and all of that stuff is basically now the, the, uh, the work of the, of the designer. So that's my first question. And the second question is that some of what you were discuss, discussing uh, reminded me of um, Babelin's less well-known book, um, The uh, Engineers and the um, Price System mm -hmm. from the 1930s, where, where Babelin sort of argues you know, this distinction between business and engineers or workmanship. And business is the disruptor, always trying to find ways to sort of maximize profit, but workmen are always sort of, through the constraints of their technologies, are always able to sort of innovate in some way. Yeah. And it starts to be part of the story that you told too, you just as you just responded to Paul, is that the unions in fact constrain some of that innovation and that what Babelin was talking about was really not the case mm -hmm. in terms of workmanship or engineering because of a, a, of a kind of, you know, it struck me that any of those uh, Lamatite uh, operators could have learned another system and sort of secured their, their mm -hmm. needs of, of, of employment. Mm -hmm. So those are sort of two questions. Right, I'll start with the second one because I remember it and I'll kind of try to work back to the first one. Uh, I mean, I think that the, 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 the basic, um, there, there's a problem in IT where they sort of wouldn't really see the full impact of the, some of these technologies until they were right on top of them. Um, but once the writing was on the wall, and in some cases it was earlier than others, they, yeah, they basically wanted to sort of uh, be put in charge, they, they wanted to get jurisdiction of that. Uh, they didn't want this to just be a way of working around the union, not even just for their own sake, but for the sake of sort of, um, you know, I mean, basically, like, part of what I'm trying to trace out here is that just when the Macintosh comes out, the role of organized labor in forming these technologies uh, sort of disappears. So, so I think that there was, many of them were kind of, they were willing to work on these new technologies. Uh, they didn't want to see it as a way that was part of this kind of broader attack on, on working people and on unions um, during that period. Um, and I think that like, you know, that, that there are places where they were trying to pull back uh, the adoption of certain technologies. Um, but whether that actually constrained innovation, I'm not sure, because in the, in the broader sort of, uh, the broader picture, um, it's actually difficult for me at this point to imagine the specific technologies we have coming into being without, on one hand, the profit motive, sure. and on the other hand, the intransigence of these workers, yeah. that they needed to be completely, you know, bypassed. Um, and so I think that there's a lot, that's sort of what I'm trying to dig out about kind of looking at more, more uh, recent practices, is that it's sort of on the basis of this, of this other, this other dynamic. Your other question, I think that there is something about, um, the, the way that I've started to think about this is that I, I you know, when I was, back when I was a graphic designer and I saw this archive for the first time, I had this sense that there might be some parallels which could be drawn between the two things. Um, certainly, the, the like publications like Immigre, or even sort of the art book fair phenomenon now, is very similar where there's, there's, this, there's a, a type of worker that has a specific type of access that's different from the kind of general access to making memes or something. Um, and they use that to publish and to educate themselves and to, to advocate for, for some sort of social interests. That's very similar, at least in the 90s, before this stuff was, was very widespread. Even though the politics of it is very different, uh, formally it's very similar to sort of uh, the print workers. And I don't think that they're aware that um, the, the print worker kind of uh, tradition is something that they're inheriting. Um, so I think that in some ways we are kind of on a higher technological level, whereas you're saying a lot of the processes are kind of opaque to us. We are kind of re-entering this place where people are expected to, to wear all these different hats, um, which is similar, even though it's oppressive in a lot of cases, it's similar to 
the kind of thing that William Morris and the arts and crafts people wanted to return to, where it's sort of someone could get in their head a kind of full image of, of a task and its context and its materials. Um, so I think that some of that is happening, um, but it's just uh, it, it's it's at a level that is very different and it's kind of um, mediated by uh, large scale economic uh, transformations that I think are difficult to get to get a point of view on. That's why I went back to grad school to try to get sort of some, some perspective on basically my own practice. I was in design school in the '90s, and I you know was there for this whole kind of postmodern explosion. Uh, and when I went back to that theory as someone working, I found that it really didn't speak to my experience of, of actually participating in the economy at all. I don't know if I can. Yeah. Is one of the problems why, why these unions couldn't survive is because a lot of the white males that worked in some of these print unions didn't want to align themselves with, say, the women and minority that were doing this other kind of work. Mm -hmm. To an essence, to, to have really have, have made a, a difference in the workplace. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was definitely that was definitely a big part of what was happening toward the end. The thing about the ITU is that um, you know that there there were all sorts of uh, uh, Parsons, the the um, Hello Parsons, the um, the Haymarket Martyr. Uh, he was in the ITU, you know, so there were, there's a, a deeper history of sort of socialists and abolitionists and, and radicals involved in the ITU. By the 50s, they're pretty comfortable, they're kind of Cold War liberal, um, but the, even though it wasn't a gigantic number of workers in the, in, in the way that like other industries would be, it had an incredibly kind of internally um, diverse kind of political scene. There were two kind of dominant parties, kind of like the Democratic and Republican Party, that would kind of take turns going after each other and trying to lead uh, the, the organization. That didn't always perfectly map onto sort of our political categories, but it was mainly sort of the progressive party, uh, which a lot of the characters that I, that I looked at, including um, Rosemont himself, uh, were much more willing to strike uh, and less willing to sort of work things out of the ballot box uh, after the fact. So, you know, in some cases, there are people like, like the person that I interviewed for Jacobin who actively tried to, to incorporate those workers and to challenge the old white men who were running the union. Um, in other cases, um, there are cases of uh, uh, black Detroit auto workers uh, trying to get stuff printed and the, and the ITU there wouldn't print it. Uh, so they had to go to this anarchist printer um, at Black and Red Press who actually, uh, a friend of mine just wrote a book on this, Danielle Bear's book on uh, the Detroit printing co-op. They were actually in the 70s using a work process it's almost exactly what the Tribune tried to use to, to destroy the strike in the 40s, where it was sort of like um, IBM's uh, kind of, yeah. yes, electric yeah. typewriter that could then be sort of pasted up and transferred photographically. So, so I mean, um, I think that uh, as, as, as far as the general policy, I think that some of it was a problem of sort of cultural difference and, and racism and misogyny, although there were, there were always a, a certain number of women involved in the union. Some of it was trying to produce, uh, sort of reproduce and preserve this craft, uh, which was strongly male and white and American, um, so that those things tie together. Um, but I think the problem really at the end was the kind of short-sightedness about, about how far this, this uh, transformation was going to go and how kind of, um, in some ways, outmoded that craft basis already was in terms of a, a way of actually having a, a solid workforce that, that actually produced things. And not, you know, like a craft fair thing. I had a couple comments and questions. Um, I moved to Chicago from Los Angeles in 1981 uh, as a typesetter um, and ended up becoming what we call typographer because we worked for mad, rad people in small uh, type shops. So there's some stories I could tell you later, maybe, that would tell you about that. <laughs> but um, you mentioned the Haymarket Martyrs, and I think a number of them were uh, typographers or in the ITU. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up working at one point uh, in the Haymarket building on Jefferson Street in the 80s. Um, and 
Downstairs was Davidson Type Shop, which was a union, which was an ITU shop, a very, very highly skilled, highly paid people. And upstairs was where I worked at Chi-Town Typographers, which was not union, but we kind of worked together with some things, had to go downstairs, some things came upstairs. But I wanted to go off the comment that was made over here about Rosemont and how people would never accept, you know, the new lack of craft. We had the same situation in terms of typography, that salesmen for the ad business and designers and, you know, the owners of these type shops maintained that the ad agencies would never accept something that was produced other than in the high quality of the thing because of the typography. And of course, that eventually went by the wayside. And I rode the wave down into oblivion, but was lucky enough to really love the Macintosh and, you know, that was the forge career after that. But my question is, there's sort of an air of inevitability about all this, about technology and changes in labor relations. But I wonder, when I was a typographer, the very pinnacle of type design and technology in the printing industry came out of Germany. You mentioned the guy who was hired in New York to invent a lot of, well, not an iron time machine, Mergenthal, all the big type founders were German. And I wonder if, what happened, what happened there? I don't know if you have any knowledge of this, but I wonder if there's a contrast in terms of unionization that there's no Taft-Hartley in Germany and the misery that was the result of this kind of transformation here. Is that inevitable or did it really have to do with political and social relations on a certain level? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to get, just because we know what happened, it's hard to get away from the inevitability. I mean, I do think that there were some periods of possible intervention, but also there are a handful of good things that came out of this transition. So the ability of kind of regular people to circulate texts, the kind of things like sort of like rub down type and these new typewriters and things like that that enabled all sorts of countercultural and queer and radical publishing in the 70s, like while the union was just sort of starting to tank. So I think that there is, I don't, it's a very American story right now because a lot of the inventions happened here. The bottom lines of these newspapers are actually driving a lot of the technological change. So I want to look more into, I know someone who's written about sort of the adoption of the line of type in the Soviet Union, in Russia and the Soviet Union. And I'm sort of interested in the way that it would play out under a completely different way of organizing work. I know in Germany there is still a completely different sort of set of regulations around printing. Books are much more expensive, German books, because they sort of guarantee all these kind of middleman roles that have not been quite totally undone by Amazon and things like that. And I know someone actually who, what's her name, who organized the design conference, the history conference we went to, who writes about sort of the transformation of the German type industry and I'm forgetting her name at the moment. Not the Teal Twig. No, the younger woman who was one of the organizers of that who then has written about similar things about the overlap of the rising graphic design profession and the falling kind of print typography profession. And she just hasn't published any of that in English. So again, I can only read a couple of words at a time. But I think that, you know, judging from her project, I think that there probably are going to be people who are kind of digging into this. And as I say, even these kind of very non-scholarly documentaries by privacy designers, there's a kind of general interest, I think, in trying to kind of dig out how all of this happened. And to me, that's interesting because they're, you know, I use a lot of these design documentaries to teach. And there was a wave of them that came out in the early 2000s after the 
the documentary Helvetica, which did pretty well, it was pretty popular, um, that all are kind of about design changing the world, and uh, these are all about the world changing design. They're all about sort of automation and de skilling and kind of people trying to go back to these uh, older methods and figuring out what they're about. Um, and I think it's interesting there's been like 10 of these that have all come out since 2008. Um, so there's a kind of, I feel like there's kind of a sensitivity to this idea of disruption and, and disruption of employment that's become legible in a new way. Where for so long, the graphic design thing was so much about kind of very ungrounded claims about, about what graphic design does to people directly. But it's great to hear your, I'd, I'd love to talk more about how that looks. <coughs> I'll ask a question. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about this, uh, the sort of different things that contributed to a failure to innovate from a solidarity perspective, whether uh, joining with other workers in some kind of uh, cross-industry mm -hmm. relationship, or um, I was wondering, you sort of open with a meditation on a kind of modernist moment from, a, from an aesthetic perspective. <coughs> like to end, you, and you mentioned the sort of holding on to their sense of being craft people mm -hmm. too long mm -hmm. um, as um, keying into that. And I was just wondering, you know, to what extent does a sort of um, uh, the aesthetic beliefs or tastes or concerns or um, what have you in the middle of the 20th century relate to or not relate to this? Or mm -hmm. does it register these uh, this kind of myopia in some way, uh, mm -hmm. that, they, that these kind of solidarities were not gonna be able to be mm -hmm. forged. Um, mm -hmm. Is that an argument you wanna make or not? It would be different than say 100 years previous to that um, in any way. I mean, and then just to, to get it back, one of the reasons that interests me is because, it, you know, academic um, unionization and mm -hmm. solidarity interests me too, and you have a lot of the same problems of people mm -hmm. being inside their own structures, their belief systems, their arguments, and um, so forming solidarity has become yeah. problematic. Right. Right. Yeah, so like, you know, having, uh, I mean, taking the kind of uh, academic example, that there are people who all work in the same workplace who have very different interests in, in the way that that workplace would be run. Um, and, it, and there are a handful of examples, UI, UIC is sort of an example of kind of tenure and non-tenure track people being in the same union. It's, it doesn't always, you know, people have fundamentally different uh, kind of interests. Um, you know, there have been proposals for like having a, a citywide IWW type union for adjuncts so that they can't be kind of played off one another as easily. Um, so I mean, I think that all of these things have been, all these things have been sort of implicit in earlier labor struggles where uh, there are just, you know, there are people, you know, for example, uh, the, the, when the lithographic and letterpress technologies were on a kind of collision course, if you were in one or the other of those unions, it would have taken some really radical rethinking of organizing to, to have completely gotten around that problem. Um, I feel like there's another part to your question. The, the other part was, I really wasn't sure aesthetically whether there was something about what was happening Mm -hmm. In the you know, with modernism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that contributed to some of the social conditions that prevented solidarity. Yeah, I mean, uh, the modernism thing, it was just sort of, I, I wanted to touch on that periodically to sort of uh, mark where I was in design history and to sort of show that this was kind of another, another layer to that. One thing that I started to think about as I was working on this was um, the image I showed of um, Massimo Vignelli's uh, Unigrid. Uh, this, you know, in the 80s and 90s became the sort of, the, it became the kind of thing that became this huge punching bag for like the kind of rationalist, clean um, approach to modernism. But what kind of being stuck in this labor history archive for so long, what I started to see in that is that if you came up in the industry in the 70s and 80s, those kinds of grids were di directly sort of directing your labor. It was, they were, there were tools for managing the labor of sort of, um, junior designers and typesetters and sort of different kinds of print workers. So I mean I spent a lot of time kind of laughing at the at the postmodernists for like getting sort of freaked out about the grid and wanting to burn it down. But if you if you actually sort of think about the the, the work conditions of this, 
uh, it was a kind of uh, not completely on the surface critique of the conditions of their work. And having done this, 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 um, this sort of dip into um, the, the printers unions and the typesetters and typographers, uh, I'm trying to then kind of bring that back into the way that I read these experimental practices in the 90s and 80s. And I think that there actually is a lot there that's kind of about people grappling with the conditions of their work. Um, but at a time when all the unions are gone and that's not really thinkable in the way that it may have been. Um, so for example, one of the one of the slides, one of the last postmodern slides I showed was um, this David Carson spread, which is really famous among graphic designers because uh, it was a story on um, the singer Brian Ferry and this designer who was sort of this kind of pop star type figure himself among graphic designers, uh, read the story and hated it and thought it was really boring. I was trying to sort of decide what font to set it in and got to the end of the list and decided to set the entire thing in a, in a wingding font so that it was you know, a font that was completely sort of sparing people the trouble of reading this article. <laughs> and um, it's sort of a bratty, you know, it's like the kind of thing that's not even did and it sold copies and it was sort of controversial or whatever. But I mean, I think that the, the resonance of that gesture with designers at the time is really interesting because in a weird way, he's sort of playing at going on strike or sabotaging the machinery. Um, and there's, this is kind of all through that postmodern period. There, there are these gestures of sabotage, of shirking responsibility, uh, of kind of abandoning um, the, the structure that the one has been forced on one. Um, so I think that the, there's a way that men read um, these other kind of motivations uh, under the surface of that without, without uh, sort of ascribing a political ideology to these people who weren't really necessarily that interested in labor politics uh, in anything they wrote. Sounds incredibly interesting. I need some help in unpacking a few um, scenes that I've seen as kind of contradictory. So on the one hand, let me talk about contemporary designer. Like in a way, the contemporary designer is an incredibly privileged person. I mean, let's say Vignelli or mm -hmm. examples, mm -hmm. right? So I'm trying to figure out how did the designer, or the graphic designer, go from a position of not being terribly privileged mm -hmm. into incredibly privileged? Mm -hmm. Because one needs time and money to also execute all of these incredibly, avant, you know, these avant-garde mm -hmm. um, projects within science. So that's, that's just one thing I'm trying to figure out. And then the other thing is, relates to the crisis that I read a little bit about in the Society of um, Typographic Records at UIC. There's a crisis in graphic design in the middle of the 90s, according to the minutes and all of these conferences, about less the designer losing their job, but gaining work. There's also, at some moment, the problem inverts from losing one's job. Obviously, jobs are still being lost in newspapers, but within the avant-garde, it's not about losing a job, it's about getting work, mm -hmm. because the computer has democratized mm -hmm. the field. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to fit that all together mm -hmm. and hoping mm -hmm. you can help. I, I am too, but I, I, think, um, I think that, you know, I mean, part of, part of my approach to this has also been influenced by, by teaching undergraduates. Um, I, I took over one of Michael's classes and, and picked up one of these readings of his on the sort of uh, rationalization of, of photo engraving in the 19th century. Um, it's, huh, what? That's such a great text. It's great, it's a great text. And it's, uh, it's called Mechanization of the Image by Gary B. Henry. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's about people who were engraving pictures for illustrated periodicals in the 19th century, not something I would expect the students to respond to at all. I, I, I like talking about capitalism and industrialization and automation, but they were really interested in it. They were really interested in the way these people, their work was really valued at one point. They had sort of a kind of autonomy in the way that they uh, interpreted images through their practice. But as that became more kind of rigidified and, and, and kind of uh, standardized, they became kind of lower than, than the lowest sort of worker in their shop. 
Um, and I, I've really been struck by the way that the, the students right now uh, have just a much different attitude towards technology than the students did in the, at the end of the 90s when I was in grad school. Um, and it's not necessarily that they think the robots are going to take their jobs, but it's just the work is harder to come by. Uh, you end up giving all this stuff away. You're, you're kind of like posting stuff on Instagram, hoping something will take off, but that's all sort of free labor that you're doing. Um, so I think that there has been, uh, there are still the sort of hyper elite designers, um, and these are the people who do a lot of the writing and sort of self-reflection about, about, um, about the field. But I think that there, there are a huge number of people who do this for a living or, or something like a living. And that has been, I've been more interested in trying to get my head around what it is, sort of how it exists in, in society in that way. I guess then, for me, the question is, if, if the origin story is in the newspaper, what's, like, I'm keep also thinking of C. Wright Mill's essay, The Designer mm -hmm. of Anna Hill, like, mm -hmm. where is the designer in the newspaper today? Mm -hmm. so I think that would be, because then it's, we're talking about the same context. Yeah, yeah. Bigger, okay. Right? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, th there's a longer history about um, sort of the way that um, you know, there, there, there are these different sort of accounts of the way that automation and de-skilling happen that are about kind of uh, the holistic skill of the craft being divided up between, as you were mentioning before, a kind of managerial direction of the activity and people who just sort of, uh, you know, tighten the bolts all day or something. Um, so there's a similar story to tell about, about graphic design, and in one recent book, they kind of nailed this to Art Nouveau, because with these Art Nouveau designs, you suddenly could not uh, kind of produce this on a press without having to sort of call out and order um, kind of pre-made blocks from people who are increasingly identified as designers. Um, so um, I think that there's a longer story to tell there about sort of the, the the, the rise of the, of the graphic designer as a professional category and the decline of the printer. The uh, graphic design in English uh, come, is sort of uh, popularized by Dwiggins, who was one of the first people to sort of take some ideas from William Morris, mm -hmm. but kind of totally get over any kind of problems of divided labor and bring in kind of line of height production. Um, so I, I'm, I'm meaning to kind of show that there are similar sort of structural similarities between kind of a printer in the 1890s and a graphic designer in the 1990s. But it's also a story of those kind of coming into a conflict. Um, and sometimes when I get on this kind of tangent about newspapers, it sounds like I'm, I'm talking about um, the kind of th them as kind of precursors for designers, but they're more sort of precursors to, to the tools that we now use that package all of that, all of that knowledge and skill into, into kind of standards that the trade is based on. Oh, sorry. Uh, just a, a quick follow-up, uh, Dakota. I, I'm thinking still again uh, something that Paul mentioned, but this struck me as kind of interesting. At least at the core of this is that I agree that your the story that you sort of presented uh, today really had to do with this sort of radical rethinking of the technology in terms of type production and layout for the the sort of uh, the making of the newspaper. One of the things that get, gets lost, I think, with the loss of the union is uh, whether these uh, union uh, folks were uh, linotype operators or not, they were familiar with a certain kind of tradition of typographic excellence. And I think this is something that Paul was getting at. And I think once that, that legacy or that tradition or uh, that form of life gets sort of eradicated through mm -hmm. automation, that tradition gets lost. Mm -hmm. Right, and so that there is no, you know, I'm thinking back to, um, you know, a famous uh, lecture that uh, Gow uh, Frederick Gowdy gave to the uh, advertising type typographers organization or something about, you know, this sort of that kind of loss of the history of typography that transpires once you. Um, to borrow from Douglas McMurtry, go modern in that particular sense, in the way that Lozinski and the other mm -hmm. typographers were sort of interested in. But that radical cutoff of legacy um, or tradition, um, that radicalization, that comes about through the radicalization of 
production as well, um, really sort of um, unmoors uh, the the the, uh, the practitioner in terms of um, you know the idea that I think that quote you said about being a, an apprentice and then a journeyman, and that's not nothing. You know, mm -hmm. like that twenty years of working of operating a linotype is mm -hmm. a form of education, not just of manual skill. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm wondering if there if there's room for that sort of uh, that sort of discussion that sort of really comes about same time Lizinski is making these arguments mm -hmm. the so-called American traditionalists or new traditionalists in the UK mm -hmm. Morrison are making similar mm -hmm. uh, arguments against um, sort of uh, uh, so they're making arguments for uh, a tradition or legacy but they're not denouncing modernization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, it does. It does. Um, I lost part of the thought, which I'll get back. But I mean, I think you know, we've talked about this before. One of the interesting figures here is is Franklin Wright, who writes this article called "The Art the the, the Art of the Machine Art and Craft of the Machine," yeah. where he's sort of breaking company with William Morris and saying, actually, in ways that, in some ways, are very similar to things that the constructivists and, and uh, people like that were saying, where it's like. Uh, at a certain point, we have to leave behind our kind of romantic associations with this kind of work and see that a lot of it is torture, torture inflicted on both materials and workers. Yeah. And if we can sort of um, re, uh, re approach the machine, this is all throughout uh, the social literature of the same period. What would it mean to kind of re approach the machine as a product of human genius that could then sort of be put to work? Uh, to, to get rid of the kind of suffering involved in the work. Um, so I think that is, um, <laughs> that's a big part of, of how I kind of read a lot of these people. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, you know, maybe to tie some of, get back to some of what you were talking about with the, um, the C. Wright Mills essay and sort of this idea that the designer, in a way that's not really different from other workers, is kind of stuck in these gigantic, uh, kind of institutional arrangements and movements of capital. Um, and the argument that he makes there is that, you know, sort of these modernist designers really wanted to produce a kind of once and for all solution to something like a typewriter. But then the accounting department comes back and says, this thing has to be paint next year so that more people will buy it. And the sort of the way that they struggled with sort of developing an individual craft that was objective in some way, uh, and at the same time had to respond to the the pressures of, um, of, what's that called? Um, uh, Planned obsolescence. Um, so part of this is sort of using the, the printers to describe the ways that these broader pressures and constraints operate on any practitioner as a way of a sort of intervention into the kind of, what I think is kind of excessive agency that's, that's associated with a lot of design writing. Um, but another part of it is definitely to sort of uh, resurrect how many of our tra traditions come out of really the printing uh, background rather than graphic design, which is a fairly recent phenomenon. And that all of the kind of standards for how this stuff works, what it's supposed to look like, um, this, is this is just as much a part of the history. And it's easy to lose that when kind of uh, a lot of those standards have just become part of the kind of operating system that's what we use rather than something that came from a place and was responding to a constraint of its own. Maybe oh, so well, I, I just wanted to jump in and go back to, in that same regard, to go back to Penelope's question about when did designers become, use that privilege, to my way of thinking, we're really talking about stars, right? We're talking about um, people who have outside reputation. Mm -hmm. And your reference to a new book on Art Nouveau or an article on Art Nouveau made me think because I've always associated that change with the arrival of modernism on this mm -hmm. side of the Atlantic mm -hmm. and its transformation from a, <clears throat> uh, a social critical um, movement uh, mm -hmm. with strong leftist tendencies into a tool of modern American advertising. Mm -hmm. And that's that critical moment in the 20s when everybody is writing about how great it is or how awful it is. Mm -hmm. It's all about making a sort of business. They're very self-conscious about that. Mm -hmm. um, the designer is much more than 
uh, and the admin is much more than the people who are doing book design or mm -hmm. certainly the people who do uh, newspaper typography are very much aware of the fact that it's all being driven or it has to be driven um, by the needs of modern businesses that they're selling to us. I like very much the point about the the sort of DIY designer approaching out the art book fairs, mm -hmm. where you really do see the return of the handmade process, or even the you know, the riser printing, mm -hmm. which is done incredibly cheaply and and quickly and on mass, but it produces a new kind of genre of publication, right? But at the same time, isn't it not quite different from the earlier period in the sense that those designers are entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the proliferation of yeah, new, so. it, and so it's less driven by by technology than it is by um, an economic model of market competitiveness. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking of like Wendy Brown, mm -hmm. the political theorist, that he basically says the economic economization has now trumps politicization in every domain of every life. And it, it seems as though the craft returns under new terms mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for a new objective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was once thought that Willie Brown also has this thing about sort of how the neoliberal self treats itself as a portfolio, and she means the stock portfolio, but actually, like, the life of the young designer is very much like that. You know, yes. sort of, you're building this kind of objectification of your capacities to then try to find, bring in work, and um, I think that there's, there are a lot of connections to draw there. Um, the interesting thing about the reset thing is that it isn't a new technology. It's like, a, you know, it's like an 80s kind of copy mm -hmm. machine thing that got repurposed in, you know, the Netherlands and became this other thing, but, um, um, there's a big problem in the graphic design, and that's going to be another profession too, is the bifurcation of, the, uh, of the professions. For example, you'll have a, a small group of graphic designers that, that can do creative and free, mm -hmm. and everybody else has to follow a, a certain uh, uh, dictate. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of I mean, that's part of what sort of you were talking about with the um, what Paul was mentioning with the sort of there are a handful of stars and that that's sort of where the, the kind of profile of the designer arises with these. You say a group right below the stars would have the same freedom and then you get everybody. Else. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I'm realizing as I work on this is that I need to just like uh, have Aaron teach me how to like look at uh, you know labor archive like you know to, to actually like get a count of how many designers there are. I'm interested in like, you know, how many people would call themselves that? How many people actually are able to make a living doing that? How, you know, per capita uh, kind of comparable is it to the amount of printers? Because I mean, now that no one needs to do all this work of kind of typing and retyping a text in order to get a printable, designer, graphic designers in some way, the people who like make club flyers and stuff like that, they really are like the print shops that used to exist. And so I think that that might get some somewhere and, and kind of get away from the distortion of the handful of really well-paid, high-profile stars that tend to kind of set the tone for what for what graphic design is to itself, to try to actually get a, get a, get a sense of what is actually happening and, and, and who is actually doing this work. What a great so I mean, I was just thinking how difficult that would be to do in a, and, and I mean, obviously, I know there are mechanisms that historians use, but I mean, in a world where you have gig economy and mm -hmm. graphic designers who are working in like, my former job was occupied by a graphic designer, you know, my job was occupied by a graphic designer who was doing graphic design some days that she was sitting at my desk and doing whatever I do. Another mm -hmm. So I mean, you know, I, there's got to be, and how many people are called upon to do, you know, whether they're trained in that or not, to yeah. do some graphic design as part of. And this is job. just I, just to really briefly get back to the the, the Rudy Vanderland's quote from from Emigre. That's why this is kind of so humorous to me. Is that he's saying, hey, we can 
we can read theory and write contracts and learn how to do printing and like that at the time for, for those people who had sort of wrestled all of these different aspects of their work away from these other trades that was seen as a liberation and now it's exactly the problem that people have is that like they're forced to be all of these things and not to be very good at any one of them and not, not have enough time to do them um, you can even see some of that in this kind of uh, conservative account of what was going on during the Tribune strike where he's saying oh the you know the, the executive learned how to you know haul metal around has, pro has proletarian talents and yeah. the, the artist sort of learned how to work with copy and all so I think that that's all there's a, there's an extreme kind of ambivalence to that wearing of many hats that I think is becoming it's for, for people that I teach now that's much more in focus for them than it was in the 80s and 90s when this was seen as kind of a, a brand new world of you know uh, kind of we could have, wear a different identity every day and be a different person on the internet and, and that, that was uh, that was a good thing do you um yeah. Aaron, I, I feel like we didn't talk much about is there a specific thing I could come back to in your I mean I think that yeah I I, I, I think that when my students respond to um, narratives about kind of capitalism and, and, and changes in work and, and the possibility of automation um, they are responding to this kind of broader uh, automation discourse that uh, as as you said has a kind of historical character that has more to do with uh, job opportunities disappearing than with them specifically disappearing into new technologies um, so I want to be careful about I mean this this obviously uh, is kind of legible and interesting to people in part because we're living in a moment where we're kind of more sensitive about about automation and job loss and displacement in that way without I mean I think it's a really good point that like it's in the media stuff which is much more visible than other stuff that it's that uh, that can kind of stand in for what's going on on a broader scale I was just going to say that according to the DLS, there are 290,000 graphic designers in the United States. <laughs> it's growing more slowly than the workforce. So the, number, the share of graphic designers awesome. is declining. <laughs> I could have asked you this at oh, any wow. moment. Or just, yeah. um, it's got really great pictures of the work environment of graphic oh, yeah. 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 I work with graphic <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's my feeling. And sort of the problem with all of this stuff now is that you know people are, are doing so many different things that what they sort of would, would, would call themselves on a survey uh, is different from where most of their income comes from. Or, uh, and of course, there are the, the whole other issue of kind of the, the blending of the art and design worlds uh, that in, in ways that those, those, those categories used to be much more rigid. It's I mean, I think it's symptomatic is the same things happening in architecture as well, that one has to demonstrate <coughs> versatility before confidence mm -hmm. in a certain thing. Mm -hmm. So, and that, I think that versatility is just part of mm -hmm. having to also be entrepreneurial mm -hmm. in which as, you know, design profession. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you.